ET and UFO experiences began nearly 12 years ago in Colorado? Well, it started with my first UFO sighting. It actually was a major UFO sighting in the fact that there were a lot of people around when it happened. Um, I met my wife online in a chat room, believe it or not, and she lived in Nebraska and I lived uh, here in Colorado. And I wanted to find a way to kind of entice her to come visit me in Colorado. So I thought, you know, I'm going to send her a little care package and, and chocolates, flowers, and maybe videotape the skyline of Denver, show her how pretty it was. And it was, it was a beautiful winter day. It was December 27th, right about noon, sunny out, beautiful snow-covered, you know, mountains and trees. And um, I headed up to the foothills of the Rockies, and I was going to videotape the skyline, and, but I never made it. Because off to the side of the road, there must have been about, oh, 30 or so cars pulled off to the side of the road, and they were looking... To my left, above some power lines, well, that would have been south, above some power lines. And I looked up, and I, that's when I saw my first UFO, and that's basically when it all started. Hmm. You know, another fascinating aspect of your case, which is, I have to say, is one of the most, if not the most, well-documented case I've ever run across, are the multiple hypnotic regression sessions that you undertook, Stan, where the ETs actually spoke through you, and answered questions. Is that something that you continue to do, those regressions? Well, um, I've the last one I did was... About was a year, year and a half. About a year and a half ago, I'd say. Oh, no, about a year ago for J3. Yeah, oh, for yeah. The, for I, did it, I did it for the documentary film. I did a regression. Um, it started out during one of the regression sessions I had, the normal hypnotherapist I was working with, um, was doing a regression and something happened. I changed my voice patterns, changed my uh, my mannerisms, changed. And unlike most regressions, you know, a regression session is not like they show you on TV. It's just basically like you're in a very, very deep daydream, and you can remember most everything about the regression. This was different, though. I didn't remember anything. And after I came out of it, I actually thought I fell asleep, and my wife was telling me something weird happened, and apparently it scared the hypnotherapist so much that she instantly brought me out of the regression. So um, we were introduced to a gentleman by the name of Dr. Leo Sprinkle, and um, we told him about it, and he seemed fascinated. And we needed, you know, we wanted to kind of go further with the regressions anyhow, so we hooked up with him, and when it happened, um, he let it happen, and some amazing stuff came through. Well, and you have to understand, Stan wasn't just having these regressions done for no reason. You know, the abduction experiences continued, the night writings of these equations continued, and, you know, our first session with Dr. Sprinkle was to find out if there was more to these equations. Something, because I watched him write a couple of these things, but while he was writing, he was unaware that he was doing it. And he just kept saying, there's not enough room. I don't understand. You know, things like that. So he wanted to find out if there was more, you know, to these equations that he wasn't getting. And people need to understand I'm severely dyslexic. And some of these equations are known, some of them aren't. But it's really hard for me to talk about these I don't really like the word channeling. I mean, it, it was hard enough for me to deal with the fact that UFOs were real, and now I have to deal with all this weird paranormal stuff that I would have made, you know, if somebody came up to me and said, oh, I believe in UFOs, I would have laughed at them, especially if they said, oh, um, something's talking through me, forget it. You know, there's, how do people believe that? But it's real. It's, we've, we videotape all these ses sessions. Whatever this thing is, it's, it's very advanced, and it, I mean, Luckily, we, we record the sessions because I have to look at it because I don't remember anything when it happens. And then we have to go and look up some of the, word, the words this thing uses because I'd never heard these words before. What, what is your understanding of who or what it is, if I sh can even use the word it? It, okay. it seems uh, to be a council. It, it's very hard for Stan to I'll talk her, about this stuff. I'll let her tell you. And it was very, it took a lot of uh, convincing, 
brow beating, whatever you want to call it. No, it's brow beating. <laughs> to get the Orion regressions in book form because that is where a lot of the messages are. You know, it's fascinating. Every time I read it, and I've read it many times, I find something new. So it's a collection of five of Stan's sessions. But this being that started talking instead of Stan, it's and counsel. we knew, yes, dear, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we asked, what what is your name? What are you called? And he says, I am not important. What, you know, what we do is important. What Stan, Starseed, they call him Starseed all the time. Starseed does is important. But you can call me Grandpa if you want to. So we're like, okay, that's weird. But, you know, it, it gives you this little fuzzy feeling, I guess. But he would, during the regression sessions, he, he puts up his hand a lot or stops. To It's like he telepathically communicates with these other beings and apparently it's a council of three that sometimes take turns being grandpa being the being that speaks through Stan it's very strange but it is what it is how, how do you explain that to your average person without sounding <laughs> like a complete nutball yeah you know, it, this this is really happening and there's 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 evidence in the video, in the documentary, you'll see this, and I talk about it in the book, and I actually show this at my presentations, where this thing actually lifted up its hands because a phone rang, stopped the phone from ringing, and teleported the phone through, I don't know how many three walls, walls, three walls to get it somewhere else so it would calm down, it wouldn't ring anymore. There were three phones that were moved. Three so, phones. Uh, if I understand you correctly, the phones literally disappeared. Yes. From a closet through three walls and were found across the house in a bedroom on the bed, lined up. Oh, my and that's God. That's not where they started. Now, for those that are interested, there, uh, there are transcripts of these, uh, many of these sessions available in, in your books, correct? Yes, yes. In, the, in the Orion Regressions. And um, the, probably the most um, impressive one, I think is in my latest book, Answers. Okay, great. Now, Lisa, I don't want to give the impression that you've been some kind of passive observer, you know, standing uh, uh, by Stan while these things are happening. In fact, you've been an active participant almost from the very beginning, and some of these events have been happening to you as well. Am I correct? Yes. There's nothing passive about Lisa, just so you know. <laughs> uh, what have these experiences taught you uh, about humanity's origins, our past, or our future? Are we who we think we are? You know, what I've been taught is mankind doesn't know who they are. Um, I, I saw something interesting on uh, TV not that long ago. Um, I was watching TV and I don't usually watch the news, but I saw something on, um, I think it was 2020, not 2020, CNN. And um, they were talking about the Human Genome Project. And the, hum the head of the Human Genome Project came out on CNN live and said, look, humans, uh, you know, by the way, humans are only, you know, a certain part human and 30 to 40 percent of the rest of their DNA is not found on this planet. So what does that mean? Not only have I been told by those guys that humans are more than they understand, but you know when I saw this this show on on the news it brought it home for me. And it's gonna be very hard for the human population to accept the fact that hey we are the humans are the hybrids. And um, then I learned that humans have these amazing abilities, these amazing abilities they don't even have, this ability to change quantum reality naturally. What that means is what we believe we manifest. It's a little bit different um, when it's one-on-one. -on -one. It works better if there's a number of people involved. And I do an experiment with my presentations where I prove this point. And there are times I almost start crying because it works every time. And so it really talks about global consciousness. That being said, 
there are controlling factors, not factors, I'm going to say maybe, whatever you want to call it, you know, the global elite, the secret government that understands this ability we have and they, they're trying hard to fight against it because they don't want to lose control. So what they do is they understand we have these abilities so they keep us in fear. And because we believe what we believe we manifest, we control ourselves. All we have to do is understand what they're doing in their manipulations, and we don't have to put up with that, and we change everything. You know, Lisa, uh, I wanted to ask you specifically what impact these experiences have had on your family life. Well, we've been through some really tough times, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger towards the extraterrestrials, towards each other, towards the people who doesn't want, don't want to listen to us, to the, against the people who, you know, break into our house, leave listening devices that beat up Stan, that shoot at him. I mean, they almost killed him, you know. And in the end, you know, we are so blessed to have been on this journey. We really, we really feel that way now. There was a time, what, four years ago that if we could have made it stop, we would have. But, you know, something changed and it's just what we know now is just incredible. It's just we are so and the message, thankful that we've been through this now. And the message is for everybody. The ones that beat me up, the ones that, <clears throat> you know, the secret government, whatever you want to call them, and I don't know who they are. The ones that are trying to stop this are the ones we're trying to reach the most because they're the ones that are most lost. And this has affected even my stepkids. Everybody that gets involved has experiences. That's what makes my case so different. Everything that happens, happens when there are people around. You get involved. The researchers, they start having experiences. There's, you know, we're having a conference coming up in Florida here at the end of, the, end of June 2012, end of this month. And um, he got involved with us not that long ago. He's already starting to have experiences himself. Wow. Um, what, what do you think is, if, if anything, is special about this particular time in our history? In other words, why is all this stuff seemingly happening now? We are, the human race is at a crossroads. Um, every, from what I understand, from what I've been told, every emerging, every emerging race comes to this point. And either they make it and become enlightened and join the neighborhood, or by design, they, they reach technical, uh, an advanced stage of technology where they can self-destruct. They'll destroy themselves, basically. And if you don't become involved, you just destroy yourself, and then the rest of the involved, rest of the evolved um, you know, species that are out in the neighborhood don't have to worry about you. Either way, it's a safety mechanism. And we are at that stage right now. Do I believe in this Mayan stuff that's going on 2012? Absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. I've done a lot of research, and it's actually in my book, Answers. Um, the research I've done, number one, if you talk to the Mayan elders today, they think white people are crazy. They just, they really do. And there is no word apocalypse in their their language and not only that if you try to combine if you try to pair the Gregorian calendar is what we use today to the Mayan calendar you can't compare them it just doesn't work there's an argue there's there's a, a you know they're arguing among scholars how to compare them you just can't and then taking the factor when Julius Caesar invented leap year the Mayans knew nothing about leap year so technically, if the world was going to end, it should have ended a year, maybe even two years ago now. But mm. the point is that the shift is happening. Things aren't going to be wonderful. You know, it's going to be tough. And I have something I'd like to read for you, if that's okay. Oh, please. <clears throat> it's from a Hopi elder. We are the ones we've been waiting for. You've been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It's time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. Do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. <clears throat> 
There is a river flowing now, very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold onto the shore. They will feel that they are being torn apart. They will, they will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore. Push off into the, to the middle of the river. Keep your eyes open and your heads above the water. See who is there with you and celebrate. This is a time in history where we, take, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the, moment, for the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt, and the time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. That all we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Oh, that's so inspiring. Uh, when was this uh, spoken or when was this recorded? Um, I think it was in 2006. Interesting, interesting. And it that's was... It, this, or 2008, maybe. 2008. 2008, when the shift actually began. And this was, uh, did you say a Hopi uh, Hopi shop? Hopi elder. A Hopi, Hopi elder. Uh, elder. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, Stan, uh, one of the questions that I have about your experiences is... If this really all has to do with human evolution, why are the extraterrestrials so seemingly interested in it? Does it impact them somehow, too? Um, you know, you have to understand, and I truly believe this, there are, as it is in heaven, it is so on earth. There are multiple things up there with multiple agendas, Just and there's good and bad up there, just like there is good and bad here. I believe that um, people think, and, and I, I argue with these people sometimes, they believe that we're three-dimensional beings living in a spiritual or living in a multi-dimensional uh, universe. I believe that we're multi-dimensional beings living in a three-dimensional reality. And that this third-dimensional reality or third, by, by, they call it, uh, vibrations, I guess, or densities, density. this third density, it's like the roots of a tree, and if you kill the tree, you, I mean, kill the roots of the tree, you kill the whole tree. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I believe that they're interested in us. And you also have to understand that some of these beings, not only are they multidimensional beings, but they're physical beings, and they're, are, you know, some of them are us from the future. Wow! Right, I yeah. You mentioned that uh, earlier in our in our discussion, and that's that's just fascinating. That uh, that they may have contributed what DNA to our to our uh, species, or how how? Well, according to what I understand, and again, this is in in my book. We are a conglomeration of a bunch of different things, and we are all everything in this universe is part of the oneness. Everything in this universe is part of the God source, God, whatever you want to call it. That being said, you know, we need to represent what we're from, who we're from. And it's all about love. It's all about understanding. That's what changes everything. And there are people out there fighting up there as well as down here. They don't want us to succeed because, number one, the guys up there that are against us are against our potential. They don't, they're afraid of our potential. And, um, you know, once we realize who we are, it really is a game changer. Well, you, you came directly to, the, to my next question, talking about our potential. What is our potential? Uh, what are we evolving into? Well, if we're from God, if, we're, if everything is from the source, from the oneness, our potential is limitless. We could go on and on and on and on and on. And to me, it's really, from what I understand, it's really not about the end result. It's about the experiences. And that's how God or the oneness, or because we are of that, that's how God or the oneness learns through us. Wow. Uh, Lisa, is, is this evolution something that we as individuals can actually opt out of? I think we all have free choice. We were given that from the time we were created. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really think that the people that, you know, Stan was talking kind of about 
how this transition's going to happen, you know, people may be left behind. The ones who are being left behind may not be soul ready, spiritually ready, you know. It's not like they're going to be left in this burning hell in this in this horrible place. It's just Does that make sense? Yes, it's for me it's all about choice. Do you agree? We Yes. And that's, you know, that's the journey. You know, we've been given a choice to see what we do with it. Mm -hmm. And and it's again, it's about the learning process, and and you know this shift that we're in. Some of them aren't ready to, aren't going to want to go because they're frightened. And again, it's all about fear. It's and fear is a controlling factor. You know that's how these these this global elite or whatever control the masses through fear. Uh, a source I trust uh, very much says uh, the job of fear is to spread more fear. Absolutely. That's that's perfect. We got to get away from that. It controls every moment of our lives if we allow it. Absolutely. It's pollutant. Now, uh, we've talked about uh, individual choices and individual consciousness. Uh, and then we've also sort of talked about group consciousness. How do those two play against each other and the choices that we're going to make or may make in regards to this transition? Well, I think, I think individually we are very powerful beings. And Stan and I, you know, try to meld our two perspectives of this in that the things we say and do every day of our lives affect not only ourselves but other people. But we have to begin with ourselves. So putting out that, you know, you're miserable, you need, you want, you, you know, you're all the, the negatives. The more you put that out, the more you bring that into yourself. Is it, I mean. It, so in other words, to say, I need money, you're going to get the need. You're going to get the need part. Don't say it that way. Say, I will have money. I am going to get money. I will pay my bills this month instead of, I need I need money so I can pay my bills. It's like that, you know, in Star Wars where Luke Skywalker is there with Yoda and Yoda is teaching him some stuff and he's trying to levitate that, that uh, spacecraft out of the, the water. Yes. He goes, I don't believe it. And, and Yoda goes, and that is why you fail. <laughs> that's perfect. I mean, that's really what it's about. And it's about this ability to change quantum reality naturally. But when you get... a a, a large group of like-minded, very positive people, you create global consciousness. You know, you create this very, very, very powerful energy. Individually, we have it to affect ourselves and the people that are close to us. But globally, you know, like this global consciousness is just absolutely amazing. And there's, you know, like I said earlier, I do this test at the end of my presentation that proves this. And the reason I found this test is because of some research I did um, that had to do with the Maharishi universe, uh, universe, Maharishi University in correlation with Harvard did this experiment. They went, Maharishi effect, right? uh, they call it the Maharishi effect, yes, thank you. Um, where they said they can, by just using, I think it's 1% or is it 10% of the population of a city, just through prayer and meditation, they can drop the crime rate. So they found the most, um, the worst crime-ridden city, which believe it or not, is Washington D.C. And they went to the to the you know to the the police department there, and they said, "Look, we'd like to try this experiment, and please let us know what happens." And you know they laughed at them at first, but they thought, "Well, what could it hurt?" So not only did they drop the crime rate to twenty percent, but the time they did this experiment, the crime rate should have risen twenty percent. So in total, it dropped the crime rate 40%. Now they've done this experiment over and over and over, and it's worked every single time. Uh, do you think it's going to require for this transition to happen a, a certain percentage of uh, the world to elevate itself, or is it purely an individual choice and an individual experience? It, it has to be more people believe than not. It has, there's going to be a, it has to be past 50%, and I don't know what, from what 
what we've been told, what, what I've learned, there has to be more people believe than not. And once that happens, the shift is almost instantaneous. And right now, most of the, you know, Roper polls and things like that are saying 70 to 80 percent of at least Americans believe. Believe in, in what? It, believe in that we're extraterrestrials, not alone. believe in UFOs, believe in the unity. You know, it's just, it's incredible. But that's just the United States. You now know? we have to get the world involved. But the rest of the world are opening their files and releasing the, the proof. Stuff's We're not, happening. you know. Stuff's so happening. that's pretty incredible that we, the people of, of our United States. And it's going to be, it's, gonna, it's not going to come from the governments. It's going to come from us. What's interesting is, and a lot of people in the United States don't know this, <laughs> the, the, every country pretty much in the world has opened their files to prove that extraterrestrials are real, including the Vatican three years ago came out and said, Oh, by the way, uh, there are multiple types. Some look like us, and it's not a sin to believe in them. Monsignor Balducci. Monsignor Balducci, right hand man of the Pope, a good friend of ours, Paula Harris, was was key, was instrumental in getting them to to do this. So, things are definitely changing. Yeah. And uh, Lisa, I wanted to especially commend you for your courage, and for your service, in particular for being so open about these unusual events that have been occurring now to both of you for what is it 12 plus years and including what seem to be um, hybrid ET offspring that are connected to Stan so as a wife as a mother how do you come to grips with that is it something that you now accept or do you in any way question it still well you know I, I know that they're real I know that they exist, but it's still very hard for me to to ac accept it completely without actually having a physical contact with them. Yes, we've seen them, but not as parents. You know, it, it it's they aren't with us right now. I mean, we've seen them in physical form. I've photographed them. They've showed up at conferences, stuff like that, but. I think what Lisa's trying to say is as a parent, you know, you worry about them. You wonder yes. if they're okay, you know. And it's easier to just kind of pretend that they're not real in order to emotionally be able to get through not knowing if they're okay, not knowing if they're being nurtured or cared for. You know, it's a lot of emotional stuff. Right. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, it's like, well, how, how are you okay with these other women being involved with Stan? And it, it's, you know, I was very fearful that he would find this woman that he has seven children with. But at the same time, after getting six years of searching for her, he finally found her. She walked into a, a conference, actually, that he was doing. And in getting to know her and, you know, really doing some soul searching of my own, I had to realize, you know, it wasn't an affair. No one who is involved in any of these abductions, these contacts with these beings who are, are parents of these children, had a choice in it. You know, not a conscious choice. It wasn't anything lurid or, you know, it wasn't cheating. So I had to really come to terms with being okay with, with uh, Victoria and our friend Heidi also, who is a mother of one of the children too. Well, I can't uh, let us go too much further without asking you the the big question: What are these children like? We saw yeah. we saw our first child during uh, one of the kids during a surprise book release party. Well, surprise book party Lisa threw for me when I became a best-selling author, and um, they're physical. I mean, we. We've talked to them over the phone. As bizarre as that sounds, it's real. Um, we were warned that they were going to show up at one of the conferences I was attending or I was speaking at in Aztec, New Mexico. There were multiple witnesses. We got pictures. In fact, the pictures of the ones that we've, that, I mean, they were in our backyard even. Um, we've got pictures. You can go see them but, in the book. But the very, the very strange thing about them is they, they run very fast because Stan chases them. <laughs> So it's like, stop chasing the kids, Stan. But what? it's like they disappear 
like that. So they are very much interdimensional beings. They have to be. That's the only way to explain it. They can be physical, but they can disappear very quickly. Do they look more like us or like greys or what? No, they look very human. I mean, they have our facial features. They have hair. They have, you know, little children bodies. Very, very different, though. I mean, they're <laughs> almost angelic, like little china dolls. Very thin, um, but beautiful children. They're, it's And mainly, it's their eyes. Very slanted way way too big for human eyes very blue almond shaped eyes and um, if you get my book answers you see the picture one of the pictures in there where the little girl is sitting down and she only has three fingers and a thumb I forgot we're not doing radio we could actually show a picture couldn't we yes you could please do <laughs> if I can find it and back so ahead, you know there there are and we've caught more than just one. We've caught one looking in our window. Um, one was picking flowers in my <laughs> wife's back in, my, in our backyard. My wife's flowers. Can you see that? Right. And now this appears to be taken at some kind of conference or yeah, the Aztec New Mexico uh, Aztec UFO conference. Wow. With multiple people there. I mean, this this is a you know, odd in and of itself, but the conference was being held at a Mason's Lodge, and the head Mason came up to me, he had tears in his eyes, and was shaking, because he said, Stan, Stan, these weren't human, I know they weren't human, but God, I don't know what to do, they weren't human, you know, and these people were freaking out, and, you know, this, this, this one little girl actually approached a woman, and, um, you know, talked about not being able to find her dad and she wanted to leave a message for her dad and then after my talk she came up to me and left the message for me so and the strange thing about this child was um, Victoria knew that the, the eldest little girl's name is Kioma Heidi knew that her her daughter's name is Trilly but I said okay if if I have a child then why don't I know her name so this girl at this conference actually told this woman, as part of the message, tell Lisa my name is Suri. Oh. And if so, you look at the picture of this little girl uh, that we took a picture of, and you look at a picture of Lisa when she was a little girl, oh my God, it almost looks like the same picture. It's crazy. Those children are beautiful. They seem to be, uh, I think you used the word uh, angelic, and I, 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 it actually comes through even in the pictures, in the black and white pictures there. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, you, you as a couple and Stan, uh, you've had some rather nasty encounters with, uh, you yeah. mentioned these, you know, the powers that be and people roughing you up that, that, that seem to be against this process or at least hiding the facts around it. Why would anyone want to do that? Wouldn't this transition be good for everyone? Well, you know, I've been beaten up. I've been shot at. Um, you know, we get threats all the time. We recently found our second listening device in our house just a few weeks ago. And it's about control. They don't want to lose control. This is a game changer. Once we realize who we are and that we aren't alone anymore, it changes everything. And when we find out that we don't have to depend on oil, that there is clean, free energy out there, you know the oil companies are are freaking out. They don't they don't want to lose control. Oil companies, gas companies, electric companies. You name it, and not just that. The 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 people, the global elite that want to control us, the the big money machines that want to control us, especially you know the war machine. They 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 aren't gonna. Nobody's gonna listen to them anymore. They're gonna be obsolete, and they're trying to fight. You know, it's like in World War II, the Japanese, when the war was over, didn't know the war was over, some of them. Right. And that's kind of what's going on here, I believe. So, uh, what's going on currently with you both? Uh, I understand you have a conference coming up. Tell us about that. Yes, we do. It's June 29th and 30th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it's called the Romanek Disclosure Event. And, you know, I think it's very important that... If you're able to come, please do, because, and we really appreciate you having us on your show and the other um, radio programs also, just so that we can actually tell our story. And get the message out. Because it's so very important that people know this stuff, you know, 
whether they believe it or not, once they hear it or once they see it, they tell us all the time that we've changed their lives. And that's very that's a very powerful message. So, you know, it's it's called disclosure the Romanek disclosure event because Stan's gonna show three and a half, four hours of videos of his experiences, pictures, you know, documents from the milit of government of some of these cover ups. I've been I've been given hundred and twenty top secret documents <laughs> from a three star general, you know, that nobody else has. Um, you know, and in, I'm going to speak um, the 29th, Lisa is going to speak the 30th, and then we're going to have a night watch. And a lot of times, we just won a night watch, sky watch in um, uh, Texas, Glen when, Texas, in Glen Rose, Texas, and a UFO came down and beamed everybody <laughs> at the... Oh. <laughs> yeah, we were at, on the Odom Ranch where the um, oh, Stevensville lights sighting happened. So, yeah, it was pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Uh, how can people learn more about your story and, and keep up to date? Well, there's there's going to be a documentary uh, feature film coming out sometime, hopefully this next fall. Or you can go to my website, stanromanek.com, S-T-A-N-R-O-M-A-N-E-K.com, or lisaromanek.com. Or Lisa has this amazing blog now, and I am so jealous. And... And you can get to that blog simply by clicking the little e-blog button on my website. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> you can connect with me with, through, to Facebook, Twitter, We're and all my on blog. Facebook and Twitter and all that other stuff, too. So. <laughs> it's a one-stop shop. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both again for being uh, so generous with your time and for sharing these extraordinary experiences with our audience. And uh, we invite visitors to, to leave comments and questions on the Soul Adventure TV website or on YouTube. And please feel free to share this video. This information, as you said, is meant for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having us.